Good morning, everyone. So what a great morning. It's beautiful outside and we are gathered together today uh, for this awesome event, wonderful event. We are so lucky to have in our ranks this amazing composer, musician, uh, professor of um, music at uh, Point Loma Nazarene University, uh, Dr. Victor Labensky. Um, as you know, this is basically this event today is organized by the California Association of Professional Music Teachers, Cap Mount, uh, North County, uh, San Diego chapter. Um, I recently have become the president. Um, last year I was president elect, this year I am the elected president of the chapter. And I am uh, thrilled to discover that we have amazing musicians um, living in San Diego. I myself am new to San Diego. I moved to Cal's about four years ago, not knowing anyone, absolutely not having any students. And I'm really lucky that um, I know now personally so many wonderful musicians. What a great uh, musical culture uh, we have and we still can grow, right? And basically, um, sharing with each other what we know um, really enriches our own perspectives, our own professional level. And the higher our professional level is, then the more our students benefit from that. Um, so without further ado, I would like to pass it to our wonderful presenter today. Uh, please take it from here, uh, Victor. Well, thank you so much. Welcome everyone. And Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Victor Lubinsky, and I'm so grateful to Anna for inviting me to share my newest song cycle with you. This is my third song cycle and was a collaboration with fellow Point Loma Nazarene University professor, uh, poet Katie Manning. And when I went, first went to her book release party back in, oh, I think it was four years ago, um, she released this collection called Tasty Other, and I knew immediately that these poems would make a great song cycle. So finally, four years later, after sketching out some initial ideas along the way, I completed the cycle in June 2020, what I consider to be one of my pandemic projects when other writing opportunities had dried up. I originally had arranged for an all-female cast to record Tasty Others because the subject matter is pregnancy and childbirth, but because of the pandemic, some of my original personnel um, were unable to participate with the recording. So I um, actually played the role of um, pianist. And then I'm so grateful for sopranos Elda McGinty, Peralta, and Judith spate Lebinsky, who's actually with us here today, who took on the extra work of preparing these songs. In the chat box of Zoom, um, you will find a YouTube link that uh, will take you to the song cycle I'm gonna reshare that for the people that just came in. And what I'd like to do is let you listen to the cycle first and watch the score. It's there um, in YouTube. And then I want to present to you the process I used in writing these nine songs and the symbolism that's found within. If you will click on this link in just a moment, we will take the next 20 minutes or so to listen together and look at the score presented in the YouTube video. But through our own computer audio, rather than me trusting that my Zoom is going to deliver a quality sound for you. So I think it will be safer if you're listening um, and I'm not streaming it. If you're having any trouble finding the link, you can also just type into your YouTube search, Lebinsky Tasty Other. But I'm pretty sure that if you click on that link in the chat, it should come right up. I think it, it will be fun if as we go along, you write comments in the Zoom chat box or any questions that you might have. And we do have uh, time for questions at the very end. So let's all click on the Zoom link now and um, I will, I will um, put myself on mute and we'll see you back in 20 minutes. Since we're a music teachers organization and some of you may compose or teach, I thought maybe I would mention a few of the pre-compositional aspects of writing art song. First of all, the composer needs to be thoroughly familiar with the poetry, um, having it memorized or almost. I like to start by having my students divide each word into syllables and then marking the stressed syllables in each word so that they can make sure that they're lining up metric stresses in the music with the 
the accented syllables in uh, the poem. Then I mark the most important word in each phrase <coughs> to be highlighted perhaps by note duration, intensity, or pitch. I also look for words that can be painted musically. And along the same line, I think about any accompaniment patterns that might depict the mood or scene being described. Then I draw a vocal inflection graph above the words in order to try to write a vocal line that is speech-like. Before choosing pitches, I suggest choosing rhythm and meter, including meter changes that emphasize the way one would speak the poetry expressively. I also looked for common themes among the poems that I was considering. And then working with Katie, the poet, in the selection process, she su suggested that I set nine poems to symbolize the nine months of pregnancy. And in fact, her collection of poetry is divided into nine sections. All of the poems in Katie's collection, starting with the word the, are dreams. And as you heard, many of them very surreal. I decided that I would choose only from the dream poems in the collection. Each uh, sentence, each section of Katie's Tasty Other Collection begins with, with the sentence, once upon a time, comma, there was a mother. And each section adds a footnote defining each subsequent word in the sentence. So the first section has a footnote for, for once, the second adds a footnote for upon, and so forth. I decided to incorporate this sentence and the footnotes before each song since there are eight words plus a comma to create nine footnote slash definitions. And then this led me to consider the collaborative pianist's potential role as a dramatic partner with speaking singing lines. So the singer and speaker speak the footnoted word together once, the pianist reads the sentence, upon a time, the vocalist interrupts with comma, and the pianist finishes the sentence, there was a mother. Then the vocalist says, footnote one, and both performers re repeat the footnoted word together once before the vocalist reads the definition. Regarding structure, I, was, I recalled that Brahms used an arch form in his seventh movement German Requiem where the first and last movements relate as do movements two and six and three and five, leaving the central movement, how lovely is thy dwelling place, unpaired and as a high point in the work. I decided to use this same organizational structure. You can see in my original chart scribbled in my journal that each paired movement is in the same key and in a similar compositional style. So the first and last pieces are Broadway style um, in D minor. The second and eighth songs are in F major and they're pointillistic and staccato. Three and seven are in G inspired by African-American genres. And then four and six use an imitative texture. Starting with song number one, the minor mutation starts the drama with a footnote and the opening once upon a time reminded me that Sondheim's Into the Woods also begins with these words. So my opening is a reference to this musical. Once upon a time, I wish in a far off kingdom. Remember now that the overall arch form um, has number one, a minor mutation paired with number nine, the final song, the part of the mother. Note the parallel beginning of song number nine that starts, I'm trying to get to the pedal, here we go. <laughs> and it starts with the swing eights and then to use, ad adopt a more serious tone, then we go to straight eights. The idea for this cycle as a mini drama with spoken lines between the vocalist and pianist also came from the opening line of number nine, the part of the mother will be played. And the footnote definition also includes the words Tasty Other, the title of Katie Manning's poetry collection and the title that I also chose for the cycle. Back to song one. The opening line of the minor mutation ends with a high-pitched childlike voice. So we have this from tadpole to gerbil to tiny human. So that tiny human childlike voice is trying to paint that those words. And then the words continue, spoken, somehow, and the inflection is written in, yours kept changing. The phrase, see the lengthened neck, lengthened legs, hardening hooves, features word painting as ever widening intervals depict not just the growing baby, but the growing realization that this baby is just not human. <laughs> so 
uh, you see at the top there the length and perfect fifth and then minor sixth major sixth minor seventh and then we have this Ooh, okay kind of an animal moo sound and the imitation in the piano and finally we get to the octave on the next line somehow another word painting example would be the good news is for good news major and bright up here and then we go down into the darker range of the piano and we have the bad news is minor now more word painting five feet tall we have five four time and then the ascending large interval to represent tall we also have the high place with the high note and let the baby ease and so we have the baby being born and the dropping line and another animal sound with the whinnying ease and then we have fall hard to the floor and the piano continues the descent to the floor as well let's move to the second psalm the spider web the creepy nature of this poem, scary yet humorous, led me to choose a pointillistic detached style to depict the feel of a spider's pointy legs walking across skin. Eek, okay, does that make you sick? Um, the Lydian dominant scale is used at the beginning to create a strange sound. And the paired song in this arch form is number eight that also mimics the staccato kind of articulation for this other strange scene. Pointillism is something that was used by George Seurat, a French painter, and you can see within this in large portion of one of his paintings all the dots that, are, that he paints with. Perhaps the musical equivalent would be found in Webern's Symphony Opus 21, and you can see all of these widely spaced intervals that look like dots on the page where the melody is broken up. And at the bottom, also, we have the use of Hockett in this 14th century example with a broken a line that is split between voices. So we see that broken line with the, with the singer saying sticky, and then the next eighth notes are in the piano, prickling, and then... So we have constant eighth notes, but they're split between the two. And then this pointillism with the super wide intervals in the piano. Some other word painting on that third measure, down, my arms were dropping down for the word down. There's a contrasting middle section that's whole tone and legato now. And, we're, and I use Sprechstimme in the voice to create this creepy scene. I've walked into a web as high. So hopefully that helps to capture the, the surreal um, poem here. And then another moment of ascending look up to the stars for help. And we reach the high note of the cycle that happens several times, that high A. And then the next line, look down. And so we have low tessitura for the soprano there. Number three uses um, uh, an African-American genre, th which is gospel. And some of the uh, characteristics of gospel we see here are slow compound meter, we're in 9-8 time. We see an improvisatory rhythm that's circled in gray where we have trying to imitate how a pop singer would push the beat. So as not to break your see-through skin. And then you see the separation of notes mid-phrase, alternating detached and legato notes in green. So at the beginning, I awake in my womb. And then at the bottom, you are half head. The paired movement to the outside end is the birth of jazz. So of course, there's the, a jazz style, another African-American inspired genre there. At the end of the outside end, we have the phrase, your heart gallops away, and the accompaniment you see galloping. Number four, the dream job, is paired with number six. Both are imitative texture, mostly because number six is called flight delay. 
in the Italian word for flight? Anyone? Fuga. Fugue. So in number four, the dream job, we see a quasi canon at first with the um, left hand of the piano following the right hand. And then we have the voice. I get a job as an egg. And then the piano at the local police. And then so we have this imitation going on. For flight delay, I actually start with a fugal entrance. Remember, fugue means flight. So there is a subject, and then the answer at the fifth. There's also a very athletic vocal line that is trying to paint the bounding dog. So we have this uh, larger intervals. We have the lift the blankets to check the eggs, and it gets, keeps getting wider and wider. And then we have the fry tone on cr crunch, and that crunch is uh, the fry tone is supposed to represent both a shell crunching and a dog growling. We have a descending vocal line when we with smaller intervals as we come to the tiny poodle. So we have up the broken shell and peels it back. Inside in tiny, perfectly formed poodle. And then I bring back the A idea because the lyrics say the large dog comes back. The top five notes of the harmonic minor scale are used, see the green brackets throughout this page, to exploit the interval of the augmented second which paints the odd and kind of gross thought of the translucent pink thing inside the broken egg that makes the poet feel sick. So we see grabs another egg and then wrestle the egg back. And we also have some diminished chords formed with that interval. And the piano continues with the augmented seconds. And then we have the forte K at the end of sick to really, I feel sick. <laughs> like you're coughing something up really gross. Okay. There's a circular vocal line at the end for encircling them with my arms. So it's kind of encircling the central pitch there. Speaking of central, we're now to the central piece. Perhaps it's the weightiest piece, although number nine is pretty weighty as well. But there's this recurring phrase that you see highlighted in yellow. The leaves left an impression on the boy. And I struggled with whether to emphasize the leaves left an impression or the leaves left an impression. So I did both. And on the left you see the leaves left an impression. And on the right side we see the leaves left an impression. And each time that occurs, another way to make an impression, I thought, was to have the pianist singing a drone underneath that to create that embossed kind of impression. Number six, I wanted you to see the way that Katie laid this out on the page because it's laid out like a flight board with delayed and on time on the left. And on the right, we expect to see some flight numbers, but instead we see the poem. Now, the trouble I had, the, the, the puzzle for me, was that delayed doesn't really fit into the meaning of the poem, but on time does. So you read it and you see, I plead. The woman at the counter can't get me home on time. I must go now. My milk will dry and he will starve if I don't get home on time. The next flight doesn't leave until Saturday. I don't know what day it is now. So what I had, what I came up with was I had the pianist speaking the words delayed, delayed, and then every time we got to on time, the pianist still spoke the left side of the flight board on time, but the vocalist also sang on time. And at the very end is a style characteristic, I suppose I've adopted, of creating suspense by sometimes delaying the final note of a measure. So we see that, and since this is about delay, I thought that was appropriate. I don't know what day it is now. All right, The Birth of Jazz. I wanted to also show you how Katie laid out this poem because 
we see the reference to a disco ball in this poem, and she really drew a disco ball in the way she typed out the poem, which I think is so cool. Uh, there's also the reference to Ella Fitzgerald and her song, The Blue Room. We'll have a blue room, a new room for two rooms. Because you're married to me. All right, that's the A section of that. So, um, do you want to know a secret? I actually used the progression for the Blue Room, and that is my progression for the Birth of Jazz. I think this is kind of like the Renaissance um, technique of parody that we see in parody masses, except I didn't borrow any melodic material, just the harmonies. So some jazz elements that we see in this piece, swing tempo, we see syncopation, um, extended harmonies of ninth, 11th, and 13th chords, and chordal chords built in fourths, and then some optional improvisation sections. I made them optional because um, some classically trained singers might not be comfortable doing the improvisation, but I did write out a vocal scat with very sil silly syllables so that hopefully the um, vocalist would make up her own and uh, then the piano part just has a chord chart. And then there's walking bass line as well. The form of the blue room, the, so the jazz standard is A, A prime, B, A prime, which is my form for the birth of jazz without improv. And then you can see these two A prime sections are the improv sections, and then I return to the final A prime section at the end. Some word painting, babies, high notes, will break glass, and then we have Oh, my window's still intact. Good. <laughs> um, and it only goes to an A, which isn't that high for a soprano, but I wanted to make this accessible to mezzo-sopranos as well. So there we hit, we have the high pitch in the vocal line again for this cycle. Unlike this last piece, The Birth of Jazz, where I use a recurring form created by the borrowed progression, art song form is often through composed unless the poem itself has a form that can be used as a model. And I tend to write through composed, but Katie just kept offering all of these, these uh, reasons to bring things back. So in song number eight, I brought back a snippet of the opening motive near the end, since at the beginning, you see on the left, I step out of bed and then on the right, at the very end, I return to my bed. So I figured I had to return to this and the same uh, melody in the voice as well. The song also offers a good example of switching time signatures to make the melody speech-like and to capture the unexpected happenings in this dream poem. Let me just speak the rhythm from the beginning. I stepped out of bed and into water up to my knee. One, one, two three slosh through my apartment and open the front door two three one two the flood cascades down the stairwell two three four and everything two three grass cement asphalt is underwater very frantic because it's painting a frantic scene and by changing the time si signatures it allowed it the words i wanted stressed and the syllables that were stressed to line up with downbeats some other um, word painting at the top right, we see the flood cascades down the stairwell, and then we have the low tessitura on the left for when I look down at my, and then at the very end, we have these fermata long notes for thicker, and then a tempo and faster. Finally, we get to the final song, and I want you to just listen the mood change from the opening. We're in minor now, and there aren't any staccatos like there with, with number one, but we still have the swing rhythm, but it moves then to straight eights and to recitative. Once upon a time, there was a mother.
again, there was a word that I struggled with in terms of how to set. And I found two different ways of setting it that changes the meaning, meaning um, subtly. So I have never mind, where the emphasis is on mind. But at the climax, I put the downbeat on never mind, although you see that the high note is on mind. And again, that's the high A of the cycle, the highest pitch. Again, meters chosen for word stress. You see with the slurred marks in green, there are a series of eighth notes. And to create the proper stress, I had to change si time signatures that you are looking out the, then five syllables, window of your, uh, and then two groups of four, apartment with your infant in your arms. The ending brings back the opening motive again. Thank you, Katie, because she started with the part of the mother will be played, but then you see this subtle but important significant word change. The part of the mother must be played at the end. And just note there's a different pickup rhythm for the. Their uh, um, mother is set with a different rhythm. And then will comes in on in the middle of the measure where must comes in after a fermata on the downbeat to really emphasize it. And then you see also the first time must be played and it ends on the dominant pitch with a minor chord where at the end we have, I'm sorry, major chord the first time. And then the last time must be and it ends on tonic all by her lonesome. And then we come in with a minor chord. I wasn't sure whether to make it minor or to end with a picardy third, but my poet and, and some vocalists assured me that for the tone of this cycle, it really did need to end like that. Well, thank you so much for all of your listening. I'm wondering now if you have any, any questions or any comments that you'd like to make. Um, I have a question. Sure. It's still, uh, Victor, I cannot see myself, so I don't know if you see me. I see but, you. Yeah, oh, sorry. <laughs> it's kind of weird that, you know, like something is happening with my iPad. Anyways, I have so many questions. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. It's really fun. I was thinking, were you smiling <laughs> a lot <laughs> when you were composing? Like, did you have, it has a lot of humor, a lot of humor. So uh, it comes across very, very well. Uh, the text uh, is filled with that, right? And the music and all these compositional techniques. Um, I could, I, I cut it right away. <laughs> so the, the word painting, and I really appreciate all the other different compositional techniques you used. Um, um, to me, it's very uh, stage needing to be staged. Are you planning to have it um, staged soon? I'm hoping that that things will open up and we can do it in the fall, which would be really great. Um, and probably we would do it at Peel and You, although I would welcome any other venues. So <laughs> and, and feel free to perform it. It's available on um, Sheet Music Plus. But um, my last cycle was actually with another Point Loma poet who's since retired, and his passion is he writes Marian poetry. So everything is about Mary, the mother of Jesus. And so mm -hmm. it was very serious um, and um, used octatonic scale because a lot was dealing with crucifixion and the leading up to that. But um, with this being so light, I just felt like I needed to pull in some pop popular elements as well. And so um, really different um, style from the last cycle that I wrote for sure. Um, we also have um, one of the performers here, my wife Judy, and, it, and so if anybody has any questions in terms of uh, the performance part of it, she can probably comment. I kind of felt guilty setting this. I thought Katie's poem on, on poems on pregnancy and childbirth should be written by a woman, but I wanted to make sure that it got written. So I wrote it and I figured I was the cause of a pregnancy and I've walked <laughs> through two pregnancies with my children. So uh, maybe I can, at least I had to empathize a little bit with Judy through those times, but yeah. Yeah, that was my other question. I wanted to ask, I, I'm sure you have children, but because I could feel like you had that personal connection to uh, a woman's childbirth and having children. So you, you answered the question. <laughs> I have one more question before somebody else. Um, your connection to jazz, um, 
yeah, I'm a classical pianist and uh, classically trained, and it was always something I felt the jazz. I always was fascinated, but could never. It's almost like never was able to learn that foreign language of jazz. Um, what is your connection to jazz, and how did you um, really, How do you relate? Huh. Well, my colleague Brenda Martin um, could. She she has really done a lot of work as a classically trained train, classically trained pianist over the last I don't know ten years or so to to learn jazz very well and she's she's a jazz pianist and it just didn't work out during the pandemic to do for her to be able to record this but my dream was for her to play the birth of jazz for sure instead of me I I'm not very comfortable with improvisation and I actually wrote something mm -hmm. out and it still didn't feel totally comfortable to me. But um, I, I feel like I'm very comfortable writing jazz, but mm -hmm. the, the thing is that jazz technically means it something has to be improvised, right? If it's mm -hmm. really jazz, mm -hmm. and that's the part that I um, am not fluent in. Mm -hmm. But the jazz, I guess, just came from listening and experimenting with different harmonies and rhythms. And I, I still don't know that I have the feel of the, 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 when I play with the off beats and everything, um, it's not always there. I sound, maybe sound like a classical musician playing jazz, mm -hmm. but, but anyway, yeah. 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 No, it felt very authentic. That's why I thought maybe you came to classical music from, uh, not directly jazz background, but it, that, it did feel very authentic. I have to say. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. Mm -hmm. What is your favorite piece? Uh, I think um, I want it to be the middle one because it's supposed to be the super important one, but I think it's number nine. It just, it it's so serious and final and and just the, the having it be the inspiration of this being like a, a quasi mini musical came really from that line, the part of a mother will be played and must be played so mm -hmm. i think it would be probably number nine i don't know does anyone else have a favorite <laughs> or the one that you hated the most either way <laughs> they're all and what are your next projects um that's a good question um uh, as many of you know um i wrote for alfred music who is no longer publishing um piano music so I uh, also write for um, Lorenz, um, which is a sacred publisher, and I have a sacred book that's coming out probably in the next month that's advanced, and it's the first advanced book. Melody loves advanced books that I've done in, like, I don't know, I've only done three before, so this is my fourth one, and it's been probably, I don't know, 20 years, <laughs> 15 years, 15 years since I've done an advanced book, because they don't sell as well, people don't want to do them, and only Melody buys them, so. <laughs> oh, we love your praise, your praise series is great. Oh, my students use it. Yeah, so I'm not sure. I'm um, that is a matter of prayer and soul searching to see what's co what comes next and what opportunities open up. I don't know if there's nothing else. I think we're all done. And I thank you so much for coming and allowing me this pr extreme privilege of taking your time to talk about this music. So I'm glad you had a chance to listen and um, hope you can find a use for it uh, with your vocalist friends or if you're a vocalist with your find a pianist and do it <laughs> yeah thank you so much Victor. thank you so much it was super exciting uplifting educational great to connect with you and with all the other listeners today um well thank you so much